Well, hello everybody. Uh, hello, Janila. <laughs> uh, hello, he hello everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, to this, the second half of the annual general meeting. Uh, I, as you probably have guessed, am George Harris, curator and artistic director at the gallery, uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you this evening's speaker, Jamila Malika Abu Bakare. Jamila is one of seven artists whose work is included in our current exhibition, The Politics of Sound, which in fact is an exhibition curated by Lethbridge-based curator, Tyler Stewart. Jamila is an artist and writer meditating on refusal, repetition, dedication, and intimacy through sound art, video essay, text off page, and installation-based work. Whatever the form, she centers black women with care and tends towards listening, overlooking, she received her MFA from the Art Institute of Chicago in 2019, and her work has been presented internationally. Her writing has appeared recently in Canadian Art Magazine and with CBC, and her first curatorial project, Oral Alterities, is currently on view at oralalterities.com, and I'll, uh, I'll type that in the feed uh, over the course of uh, Jamila's talk. I am truly very grateful to Jamila for joining us this evening, all the way from New Jersey, if I understand correctly. <laughs> uh, Jamila, it is a great pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, welcome and uh, over to you. Yes, thank you, George. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Like George said, I am joining you from Lenape lands. And so the time change here is a little different. It's a little later for me. And so I just um, fed my baby. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so now we're going to just get into my chat with you all. And I, I've entitled this presentation, this talk, by the name of my work. And I'll, I'll tell you a little about why in a moment. So just want to say thank you again to everyone involved. I'm sure there's lots of folks behind the scenes at Two Rivers who do very good work. Thank you for all your efforts. And I'm so happy to share a little bit about my practice with everyone here this evening. And um, it's, it's fun to be involved in, in this kind of um, meeting in the arts, you know, we kind of do have to do these important, more bureaucratic meetings. It's nice to jazz them up with a little bit of speaking from the artist. So I'm, I'm happy to do that here with you all. And I'm so grateful to be a part of the pot politics of sound, the exhibit that's up currently. I hope you've all had a chance to see it. It's curated by the lovely Tyler J. Stewart, who originally saw my work in the spring of 2019. So his intention was to mount a show the following year and include my sound art, which he heard at the audio room in um, Prefix Gallery in Toronto. Can someone just confirm that y'all hear me okay in the chat, perhaps? Everyone's hearing me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, great. Um, and if I can get the same confirmation, we will listen to another piece of sound work. And I just want to make sure everyone hears that as well. Great. Okay. So Tyler heard my work in, in a special kind of dedicated enclosed space. And uh, it was, it's, it's very rare across Canada, this kind of dedicated enclosed space specifically for sound art. I'm so glad we had it. And um, the show was with myself and another uh, Nigerian artist. I'm Nigerian and Trinidadian. And I was in the show with the Nigerian fellow named Abraham Okobase. He's a, an amazing photographer, beautiful. Uh, I'll, I'll write his name in the chat at the end. And uh, Liz Ikiriko, whose name you might be familiar with. She's a Canadian um, Nigerian artist and curator. And this show was called The Break, The Wake, The Breath, and The Hold. And I shared um, a poem printed on textile. I shared um, a video work, a silent video work entitled How High, aka Black People Watching White People Watching Black People. And I also shared this soundscape called Listen to Black Women. Uh, and so it was the first version of this newer work. 
And so when Tyler reached out to me last fall, he said, you know, the show is finally back in play and would I like to be included? And I let him know, of course, I would, I would love to be. But I also let him know that I had made a second installment of this work uh, that I had called Listen to Black Women Again. <laughs> and um, I said, you know, wh wh why don't you give it a listen? It's basically a new version on the same theme. Uh, and I had made the initial work, Listen to Black Women, by asking my friends and family to talk to me about talking as Black women. And they had sent me little audio files. And I put those together in what I called a composition. And then over the years, I, I found that I was hearing or had heard Black women with much greater reach, much greater visibility, uh, much greater wealth, much larger platforms, speaking on the same topic in different ways and having similar refrains, similar challenges. And so I thought, you know, it's curious to me that through class, across this kind of gap of like fame um, and, and really just being family and friends to me, all these Black women share these same feelings. Um, and so I made a second work featuring the voices of Amara La Negra, Angela Davis, Rihanna, Julie Black, Azalea Banks, and Kiki Palmer. And that's what's up currently at Two Rivers. I'm so glad to be there. So this talk I'm going to use as, uh, as a way to kind of break down this work by working through the titles. So first I'm going to talk about listen, then I'm going to talk about listen to, and then listen to Black, and then listen to Black women, and then listen to Black women again. Okay, so we're just going to move through those, those five, five parts. So we're going to begin with listen. I wrote a piece for Canadian Art Magazine, which appeared in their final issue. <laughs> Not that I saw that coming, um, but it was called Frequencies, and it was all about sound art. And it began with instructions for a simple listening practice. And I'd like to begin that way this evening. So um, maybe you do sit in meditation and, and maybe you don't. I don't technically call this a meditation. I call it a listening practice. Um, and, you know, you can participate in whatever way you like. Uh, you can make yourself comfortable. And wherever you land on the hearing spectrum is perfect. Uh, if you're wearing headphones, if you're wearing an assistive device, that's great. And if the word listening for you, it doesn't feel good, please substitute it with feeling, trusting that I, I mean the, the same thing, okay? Um, the, the article was called Listening Feels, uh, because we'll talk a little bit about that. But for me, uh, listening is about feeling, about being embodied, about touch and intimacy. Okay, so if you'd like, you can look down and forward and kind of rest your gaze, or um, you don't have to at all. What we're going to do is, is we're going to think a little bit about, we're going to pay attention to our ears. So sometimes kind of resting or closing the eyes can help us do that. And you could just kind of let the next exhale breath last a little longer a little deeper and notice how the next inhale breath fills up. That's the quality of the inhale. It just expands. And on your next breath out, you can just notice all the parts of the body that are making contact to a seat, to a surface. You can notice all the parts of the body that are making contact to itself. Wherever the body is resting on the body, you can notice your top and bottom teeth are touching. Maybe part them. Feel what that feels like in your jaw. You can notice if your tongue is stuck to the roof of your mouth, maybe soften it down and away any amount. You 
could take a bigger breath in, expand. And you can take a breath out. Soften, settle, let go. That's the quality of the exhale breath that just lets go. There's nothing you have to do or force to feel the breath come in and to feel the breath go out. I want you to bring your attention to your right ear. You could drop your left ear towards your left shoulder and notice especially sound through your right ear. Open up through your right ear. Open it up to all the sounds around you. Notice sound especially through this one side. Let the sounds around be the sounds around. They don't have to change. They come and go. That's perfect. Maybe you have a judgment about the sounds, maybe you like or don't like them. See if you can just notice how they change. If you are there in a quiet space, you can observe silence. Maybe there is a low whirring Observe through your right ear, especially for a couple more breaths. And if you dropped your left ear to your left shoulder, you can lift your head up. And we'll try the other side. You can bring your right ear to your right shoulder. It's not mandatory in any way, just a way to notice your left ear, especially to open up your left ear to all the sounds around. New sounds now. And maybe the quality is different on this side. Asymmetry is really natural in the body. Maybe listening feels different on this side. That's okay. And maybe it feels strange to just listen. Your mind might be worrying and going just bring your attention back every so often to the sound. Sound will make itself known to you. See if you can be as curious as you can about the sounds through the left ear for a few breaths. You can let that go and bring your head back to whatever position feels good and natural if you had dropped your right ear to your right shoulder. I want you to see if you can notice now sound through both ears. And maybe you are inside a room. I want you to stretch your ears outside of that room. 
and notice the sounds a little further away. Maybe there are sounds above or below you. Outside of the four walls that enclose around you. See if you can reach your ears a little further now, maybe to the road. See if you can reach your ears as far as you can. Listen now for the farthest sound. Reach your ears for a far sound, maybe a quiet sound. And then you can let that go. Maybe there are people or birds in the spaces further from you. We're going to bring our attention back inside the room. Back towards ourselves. Bring your ears as close as you can and listen for the quiet sound of yourself. Listen to your own body breathing. Maybe you can take a sniffle of an inhale or a little louder of an exhale to hear. Listen for the sound of your own breath. Listen for the closest sound. Last few breaths. Maybe the closest sound of your own body breathing is not a sound you have really listened for before. That's okay. Give yourself all of your attention. Listen to your Body breathing, the closest, nearest sound, last couple breaths. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes if you close them. And if you'd like, you can share in the chat how you feel. Do you feel any different than 10 minutes ago? How does it feel to listen to yourself? How does it feel to listen? Yeah, this is what sound art is about for me, okay? It's about how listening feels. It's about getting out of my head and into my body because listening is an embodied experience. This is a quote from scholar Tina Kant. She writes, while the ear is the primary organ for perceiving sound at lower frequencies, infrasound is only felt in the form of vibrations through contact with parts of the body. She writes, yet all sound consists of more than what we hear. It is an inherently embodied modality constituted by vibration and contact. So, you know, 
one of my favorite sound artists, Christine Sun Kim. She's deaf. And I think sometimes we uh, associate kind of hearing with the ear in this perhaps ableist way, but it's really about feeling, right? Like deaf folks dance, yeah? It's a vibration, this contact. Tina Kemp describes sound or listening um, as haptic, yeah? She has a book about listening to images and haptic, you know, it means it relates to the sense of touch. And uh, artist Nikita Gale is a, a really important sound artist to me. And they explain that when we speak of sound, we are speaking of touch. So when we speak of listening, we are also speaking of being touched and of feeling. You know, in this way, sound is, is truly very intimate. And we think about, or I think about touched how and feeling what. And here's a quote from Alexis Pauline Gums, who has a beautiful book called Undrowned, uh, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals, where she writes, listening is not only about the normative ability to hear, it is a transformative and revolutionary resource that requires quieting down and tuning in. And we're gonna come back to that phrase a couple times, please remember. It is a transformative and revolutionary resource that requires quieting down and tuning in. So I choose to centralize sound because it transforms a viewer into a listener, which is unusual in a gallery setting, right? The art world is so hypervisual. It is a world of eyes and of objects, of images and figuration. And what happens when we take all those visual cues away? I believe you get free. Free of all those kinds of markers that signal you to certain assumptions, yeah? And I, and I believe you get free of, of this trap of the mind and you get into your body. And so much potential here, I believe, for myself also, as an artist, I escape the dominant gaze, which so often demeans and diminishes anyone who faces the burden of representation, right? Any other. And the audience, they're free and I'm free and we can all let go of what we think we know and become curious about what we feel and can practice to be better listeners, right? To reflect on that embodied experience. If the sound is hard for you to hear, if the sound is soothing, that whole range, that's really good practice. Because in the future, you can be a better listener. I think sometimes uh, in sound studies, people abstract listening uh, into different purposes. There's some traction around the idea of listening for knowledge projection. But I, I'd really like to um, suggest to everyone that listening is for listening's sake alone. And listening and being a better listener, we're going to talk about a little later why that's so important for specifically Black women like myself. So listen to, to listen to as opposed to look at is unusual in a gallery setting. And I think the word audience is so associated with this kind of culture. And I think listeners, you know, that's really my preference. Because sound is so many things. Sound is citation, the same way an excerpt or a quote here operates, a sound operates. The kids on TikTok are all saying, um, can we make this a sound? Because they grab each other's sounds and then they repeat them back to each other. It's so interesting to me. That is something that's kind of evolved since I began making sound art. But this citation from literary understanding, it operates in the same way for me uh, as sound. And so a lot of these words I use like sonic essay, which is how I describe listen to black women again, 
this kind of overlap from a writer to an artist. Citation is another way that sound and writing to me kind of blur. And citation to me is dedication, right? So when I select uh, and elevate and proliferate certain excerpts, um, I am trying to honor those voices. I am doing that excerpt for us and in service to us. Sound is code, right? For the people who know those citations, those excerpts, the sound lands differently. If you are familiar with the experience, it might land as well. But if you know that exact quote, there are people for whom they walk into the Two Rivers Gallery and they have heard those pieces before. Um, one of the voices is Julie Black from the CBC Reads, I don't know, I think it was 2018. And so I wonder, you know, how many people remember that moment <laughs> as Canadians in our collective memory. There are people who come in and they've heard those sounds before. And it feels different for people who haven't heard those sounds. But I hope, you know, that the sounds land differently for everyone, that they're meaningful in different ways, but they always land. Because through repetition, I understand sound as spell. I think I'm doing a little, a little magic. Sound conjures. Um, Kevin Beasley is a sound artist and he uses that word, sound conjures. And for me also, as I've said, sound is intimacy and sound is freedom. And I'll get into that a little bit more, but I just want you to notice how differently those prepositions feel listen to as opposed to look at feel that to as opposed to at and when i think about how i want others to be in relation to me i preferly i the feel of to as opposed to at the feel of listen to as opposed to looked at and this goes back a long time okay this is a, a an image by kevin jones I was in a, an indie band for about five years. We were called Abstract Random. That's me in the center there. We would make and wear paper mache masks. Uh, we wore face paint. We would cover ourselves in video projection. When we performed, there was a time when I um, strung up a sheet and cut up um, cardboard uh, to make city blocks, like a whole shadow show. Um, because I wanted to be heard and not listened and not looked at, that I thought that you could do listening better if you weren't to kind of get focused on my face or my skin. And if you've ever stood on a stage and looked out onto a crowd, you might notice what I, I used to call TV face. Um, it's kind of glazed over expression, his mouth kind of slightly agape, it's kind of slack, kind of feeling in the face and the posture. And this is what watching looks like. And this, you know, could be a function of, of, of television and scrolling and these kinds of um, overstimulation and oversaturation we have as a culture with images. People can look fast and people can look away. They can stare and kind of not look at all. Make split judgments and think they know. But sound, sound is not stable. Sound asks for your ongoing attention and you cannot close your ears the way you can close your eyes. Even if sound is muffled, it reaches you. Whether it's a meditative sound or an abrasive sound, you feel it in your jaw, in your shoulders, you have a physical response. Listening is felt in two parts. You feel the vibration, and then you feel the emotions that arise as a result. And as a Black artist, when I transform the viewer into a listener, they become involved, embroiled even, in the experience in a way that puts them to work, that makes them do some labor which is not so often the case in the art world. 
the art world is a place where I have to be seen and I have to sell. The art world is a market. It monetizes, fetishizes, objectifies, and eroticizes. For a Black woman, this is all especially fraught for reasons I will not enumerate here. Um, these are headlines about the ways that Black artists are feeling the art world now. There's actually a show um, that's that's going on right now about Black artist burnout. But this is something that, that we talk about a lot. Um, it, it's a challenging place. Uh, you know, Sotheby's has an auction. And I think for Black people, that word auction, it lands differently, you know? Um, sound art, it, it's, a little, it's a little bit of an escape from all of that for me. If you're familiar with Simone Lee, the ceramicist, she talks about uh, a loophole of retreat. Now, she's making a citation here to Harriet Jacobs' written work, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. The loophole of retreat is uh, the chapter uh, title. Um, and if you think about those words, you know, like a loophole is, a, is like a way out of an impossible situation. Retreat, it can mean refuge. It, in a, in a military sense, can mean to flee. But for me, uh, sound is a loophole of retreat in that I get to escape a lot of, a lot of, a lot of this experience of burnout, um, stress, and anxiety that comes with, with being a black artist. And um, you know, I think my art does a lot of things differently in in small ways. I, I center black women. I center sound and, and not image. I make the viewer a listener. I invite guests to take something off the wall and away with them. So in all these small ways, I'm trying to upend what we think we know about going into the gallery and about who and what we will encounter there and how we are to engage with it. You know, because so much of the historical and present culture of the art world is saturated with systems of power. So when I think about my artwork, I hold dear this quote from Toni Morrison. She says, my efforts were to carve away at the accretions of deceit, blindness, ignorance, paralysis, and sheer malevolence embedded in raced language so that other kinds of perception were not only available, but were inevitable. I believe sound is an other form of perception. It's another kind of perception that points us in the direction of care and repair. Okay, so what am I talking about? Tikhatnan said, when you listen deeply, you help people suffer less. Okay, the exercise that we did together at the beginning it is a meditation, sure, yeah. So there are overlaps between my art practice and my mindfulness practice, okay? So another way that we talk about listening in mindfulness, uh, perhaps you're familiar with Bernie Glassman. Uh, he talks about, or talked about bearing witness. I believe to listen is to bear witness. To listen is to attend to, to be attentive to, to care. To paraphrase scholar Sidia Hartman, care is the antidote to violence. Okay, so what does this mean in a very practical sense? This is a tweet from Bambi, who is a black woman DJ in Toronto. She explains here, in the end, it is not our privilege, but our inability to really listen to others that makes us uphold these whack and unfair systems we were born into. So, Think again about that quote that I shared from Alexis Pauline Gums, okay? Listening is not only about the normative ability to hear, it is a transformative and revolutionary resource that requires quieting down and tuning in. So 
let us situate who is quieting down and to whom they are tuning in, right? I am putting Black women's voices in the gallery space knowing it will be a special experience for any Black women who enter, Black femmes who enter, but also knowing how many non-Black women are experiencing the work, okay? The work serves Black women and, and it also serves everyone who is not. And when non-Black women come into the space and listen instead of look, is something different happening here. Uh, Alexander Wahili, he writes, when we analyze the role of vision as it relates to the mechanisms of racism, sound emergence as a space where black subjectivity is not fixed by the look of white subjects, but it is instead articulated dynamically by black subjects. There is like a loosening of the systems of power in operation for every other when we go from looking to listening. And specifically for, for Black people, Dion Brand puts this really clearly when she writes, um, the image which emerges from the door of no return is public property belonging to a public exclusive of the Black bodies which signify it. One is aware of this ownership. Okay, so she's talking about, about Black people when she talks about the image which emerges from the door of no return. Um, in the art world, you know, this reality is pronounced. You know, if you think back to Picasso's appropriation, to, you know, as recently as the controversy around Dana Schutz, um, use of, of, of Emmett Till's image, uh, the use of, of the black image as appropriation, uh, it, it happens in the art world all too often and the image, even when Black artists use their own image, it, it is subject to this kind of public idea, this kind of social imagination around the image. I, perhaps anyone is they're familiar with Arthur Jaffa's work, Love is the Message, The Message is Death. You know, he talked at length about, about how those images um, in the art world, how they circulated and, and, and what they did for non-Black people and, and what the response he got from non-Black people was and, and how disorienting it was for him. And he went on to make a, a work immediately after uh, about white people, specifically to respond to this kind of uh, feedback that was that was challenging for him. You know, I'm interested in what happens when there's no image. Okay, so this is a quote from me, from the uh, Listening Feels article that appeared in the Canadian Art Magazine. And if anyone would like a copy, I'm I'm happy to send it to you. It's very hard to get your hands on on a physical copy of that of that issue anymore. Um, I'll, I'll share my email at the end. Um, I wrote there, I wrote, what happens to an audience when I take my body away? They must turn inward, notice their own perception, put themselves in relation. So listening makes you subject. Whatever your mind conjures in the absence of an image is for you to notice and interrogate right? You did that. It came to you. And there is more you may reflect on as the sound loops in your head long after you leave. You know, I hope that you ask yourself, how does listening to this sound make me feel? Am I comfortable? Am I uncomfortable? Have I listened to this sound before? Have I heard 
this speaker before? How have I heard them? Has this sound been silenced in my life prior to this? And why might that be? Sometimes I, I, I'm, in the past, I, I've mounted the work, Listen to Black Women, with like a guest book with some of these prompts. Uh, and, and people rarely answer them. You know, if you have been in to see the work at Two Rivers Gallery, it's worth, it's worth thinking about. Um, this work is important to me in that it's my second attempt. I thought I might give you all an opportunity to listen to the first attempt. They're quite different. Um, this is about five and a half minutes. And uh, if you could just drop in the chat that it's loud enough. Um, it starts out quite quietly. Uh, you may have to turn the sound up on, on your device. My sound is up as high as it will go. Uh, here we are. Um, as a black woman, which is black blackness, calling myself constantly being called out my for people, uh, my I, people. Um, I even uh, um, I, and and thinking. I think I think I think um, as a black woman, I think about um, I try to hide and bury um, 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 my people. Uh, my white voice when I said hi. In a way that makes white people comfortable has become I worked for 24 years in a telecommunications second, company without using my Trinidad dialect. Super uh, comfortable, uh, super comfortable, uh, super comfortable dialect. Yeah. Um, I've been moving. Uh, um, yeah. Um, I've been moving. Uh, um, my spirit in a way that woman, I feel it. I've been my moving, spirit, I feel it. trusting, so powerful yeah. power, um, like said, and or authority girl, black, in, like in, said, in relation to others. Black, um, like said, um, brown girl, um, black. Um, finding space for yourself. Uh, less, um, okay, finding actually, space for yourself. Um, really less small um, with and in my body in totality. Uh, and, uh, uh, um, um, uh, and um, 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 uh, yes, what do you uh, feel you need uh, to do um, in order to get you know, your needs met? Which seems like a lot, but uh, all of those things are happening like a lot. Uh, Ugh, I don't know. <laughs> and and uh, how I'm actually always, always, uh, always, yeah, uh, in relation yeah. to in uh, my body, yeah. uh, in relation uh, to like a lot, in yeah, my body. blackness. Um, in relation I to am blackness, in my body, um, I am what it talking means to, to be black enough, to be black enough, to be black enough, talking just as I am, as a black woman, just as I am, as a black woman, just as I am, power in her voice. That, that's her base, 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 that, that's her base. Addressed and recognized and appreciated and respected and recognized and appreciated and respected and recognized and appreciated 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 and respected. Edge on now. Make we park there now, Edge on. Oh God, please now. Where girls now? God, look my face, Edge on. Really, really loving. Loving my spirit um, in the way um, that I could feel it.
my spirit and I could feel um, it. Trusting and my spirit um, and I could feel it. Um, uh, it's so uh, powerful. Yeah, uh, it is. Like I said, um, brown girl that was you know, black. Like I said, brown girl that was black. Like I said, brown girl that was black. Finding space for yourself. Finding space for yourself. Less uh, small. Um, I'm actually in always, my body in totality. Uh, in um, relation to uh, in uh, my body. Um, uh, in relation to uh, in my trusting, body. Trusting. Uh, in or, relation to or in my body. Uh, um, what it means yes, what do you feel you have to, to do in order to get your to needs met? Which just as I am. Lot, as a black woman. All of those just as I am. As a black woman. Just as I am. Power in her voice. That, that's her base. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's like a lot. Yeah. Blackness. Um, as a black um, woman. I am blackness. Um, I black, am blackness. Talking calling myself constantly myself being called out by for myself. Talking uh, of I, myself. Um, by myself. Uh, I, and and I'm myself. thinking. Um, I think. About, I think. I think. Uh, so, so, um, as a black woman. I think. As a black woman. 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 So um, Okay, so that, that is the first iteration of this work. And, you know, it, it, is, it is vastly different than Listen to Black Women Again. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the differences and, and why. You know, I, I call this first version a composition because it is more musical, whereas the second I, I call an essay, okay? Um, a sonic essay um, in the way that people describe like video essay, right? Rhea Dillon is a, an important British uh, black artist who I studied with, a, a, took a video essay course with, and I think a lot about in my work about sonic essay. So even just in those two words, it's, it's quite vastly the different, right? The first version, it has a lot more nonverbal musicality and a kind of uh, chorus overlapping. Whereas the second version, it's quite more straightforward. There is less overlapping of the voices. Uh, this first version has a lot of panning. It's like a, a sound word for meaning the sound goes from the left to the right. The second version has none of that. It, it is the same all the way through. I mean, those things all kind of give a different feeling. You know, Tyler, I sent him the second version and it was his choice to include, you know, as a curator to say like, you know, I think I'd like to include this second version and not the first version, which is very different. I, I think, you know, the, the first version, you might prefer yourself as a listener. You might be like, oh, and I think that's interesting. I, I think that might be something to think about. Like, what is it that I like about this version as opposed to the second version, which Tyler described very lovingly as a sonic slap to the face. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, gosh, I, uh, he shared that with me. Personally, I'm not sure if I should have repeated that, but you all heard it at this, at this meeting. Trust that I, I took it in a very positive way because I was intending to do something a little different with this second version. Now, in the first version, I had asked for people to send me clips. The second version, I sourced them all online. So that found sound, uh, speeches, interviews. Um, and I collect sounds, I keep archives of sounds, you know, with file names that only make sense to me. And so over time I had, I had amassed 
some of these sounds. And when I sit and, and I work together a piece, there is a quality of feeling surrounded by, right? Um, while there isn't the same overlapping in the second piece, because I wanted each voice to stand alone, I did see, feel that same feeling of um, comforted. So that's me, right? You know, I made the first work at, away at art school where I felt very alone and very isolated and I was having a very challenging time. I made the second version um, like postpartum. <laughs> and both works felt like solace for me. Both works make me feel good and make me feel better because I, I trust in my own experience of the world more. I don't feel as gaslit in the world when people say things like trust black women, listen to black women, defend black women. You know, they don't mean these things metaphorically, right? It's because we have a different experience. Okay. Um, this is a, a New York Times article that came out recently. And I, I point to it because I keep making this work because it's important that people listen to Black women. Um, being listened to has, has very real effects in our lives, how we are heard. Um, if you're familiar with the death of Esmond Green, this is a, a black woman who died in, in a waiting room, in a hospital waiting room. She had been ignored. But this is an experience of, of a black woman in the same kind of medical situation in the healthcare. Uh, and, you know, we like to believe that Canada is quite different from America, but uh, as a black woman, I can tell you, I've had this experience of uh, medical racism in Canada, in Toronto, in Vancouver. And I want to point out here that I talked about listening as feeling, okay? Being listened to is also a feeling. You know, if you think back to the moment where I asked you to listen to the sound of your own breath, right? I'm sure there are people in your life who make you feel listened to. That, that's, a, that's a really distinct and life-giving, nourishing feeling. Being listened to is being affirmed, being um, held. You know, people talk about to hold space in a way that is like, I'm not sure what, uh, you know, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, like it's a, a slogan or something but to hold space to listen is to hold space and I think that everyone needs to practice listening to black women and to be able to listen more skillfully to black women to move past some of those visual cues and snap judgments around angry black women but to really sit with how it feels to be uncomfortable, how it feels to be perhaps shocked by what a Black woman is saying. Okay, I call this second version, listen to Black women again. I will call a third version, <laughs> perhaps listen to Black women still. <laughs> okay, for everyone who hears these, I believe the experience puts into relief all your previous exchanges with Black women. To 
to think, did I listen? Did I hear what I wanted to hear? What did I hear? Because my hope is that with the opportunity to practice, your listening shifts all your future interactions with Black women. The Black woman in your office, the young Black femme on the bus, the Black girl in your classroom. I hope these exchanges can shift towards her freedom. Because if Black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. This is from the Kumbahi River Collective Statement. These are the stakes. In my own small way, I am working towards our collective freedom. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. I'll take a moment to drop into the chat everything I promised to. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you very much, Janila, uh, for uh, a really wonderful and moving talk. Um, <clears throat> we, we do have some time for some questions. And uh, I would like to ask uh, all of you participating in this talk, this meeting this evening, if you could uh, drop any questions you might have either into the Facebook or Zoom chat, if you can please type them in, uh, then we can relay them to, uh, to Jamila. I see some expressions of appreciation so far. Yes, thank you, everyone. I think I think I'm. Uh, these are the names that I promised. Uh, Christine Sun Kim, Abraham Okabase, Liz Ikiriko, and I saw was it Sarah who chimed in that Liz is so great. Liz is so great. If you're not familiar with uh, Liz's work, please, please to look it up. Thank you. I really appreciate everyone's gratitude and appreciation. And if you would like a PDF of my article from Canadian Art Magazine, I'm, I'm happy to email you a PDF. <laughs> you can email me. <laughs> um, it's hard to find. Well, thank you, Jamila. <clears throat> and we may have it here, but- uh, Oh, if, good, good. Uh, if uh, just, just in case, if you might uh, send it to yeah. us. Oh, we, sure, yeah. Yeah, forward that to oh, yeah. any other people who uh, who make an inquiry of it. Okay, good. Well. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, we have one question here. I see it. I see it. Yeah, you know. Um, so I, perhaps I'll repeat the question for the Facebook folks. Is that it? I would love to know how your experience of being listened to has changed positively or negatively as a Black artist over the last two years. Um, in my first five weeks at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, I, I was in six separate meetings about um, curriculums and classrooms and whether or not we could have free and open conversations about um, what was happening. So like I, I was in like all these meetings with administrators about um, how I found lacking <laughs> the, the inclusivity, you know, of the classroom space itself, but also um of the curriculums so um i i had a hard time feeling listened to and I, and i talked a lot about what i call speaking scene <laughs> um you know that that um a lot of a lot of uh non-white folks talk about this like the the kind of exchange you can have with someone over the phone 
and then you you walk into the space and they're surprised to see you um you know sound is not a space that's not devoid or that is devoid of of these kinds of judgments it's just kind of some more room uh i find as opposed to looking but i think being listened to has been has been hard for me in in the art world in that the art world assumes itself to be like this kind of free um like free cool space i don't know i i want to like use the word bohemian or something but i don't think that's quite the right word but it, i think the art world fancies itself um you know different than like the literary world or um the media or i you know i think folks feel like there is more space but black artists we we really do kind of bounce up against a lot of the same draining uh assumptions and expectations um i feel like the spaces where i feel listened to in the art world have been with the curators that i've been really lucky to work with and so working with tyler j stewart or working with liz ikiria ikiriko or working with uh sophia Said, these are folks who are really interested in in my process and 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 not so much just um the product and they've made all the difference yeah but it does feel rare to be to be listened to you know, I think sometimes you, when we used to go to openings, <laughs> does anybody remember that? <sighs> Ooh, when we used to go to openings, I used to really get stressed out. I, uh, um, you know, openings like here, it, it, I would go to openings in New York and I would be like, oh my God, I don't have the right jacket. Everybody is wearing, I didn't get the jacket memo. Right, like there, there is this kind of really um, intense trending that happens in in the art world. You're supposed to wear all black. You're supposed to, I don't know what, um, look a certain way. Um, you're not supposed to be a mom and to have a, a ten month old baby. That's <laughs> inconvenient in the art world. But you know, I think there are spaces where uh, you do find other folks who are really interested in what's possible when we move past a lot of those kind of aesthetic values. I, I recently spoke at a conference by the same name as the show at Two Rivers Gallery a conference called The Politics of Sound. Um, and it was with uh, a couple of universities based out of Toronto. And everyone there was talking about listening. And so that that was there are kind of these pockets where where people are interested in in listening to each other closely and and that has really has made all the difference thanks for asking that kate i'm gonna think a little bit more deeply about about that but i think for a lot of black artists there's a kind of trauma porn um that that we feel a certain kind of pressure to produce a certain kind of art 
you know, and this is why a lot of young black artists don't want to be black artists. They just want to be artists. <laughs> I've never felt that way. I've always wanted to just be myself as a black artist, you know? Um, thank you, Kate. I, I hope so too. Because the trauma porn is, is it's a trap. And, and if you are an artist of any kind of othered identity, whether that is queer or disabled or POC or mentally ill, and people want you to tell a certain kind of story that is very easy for them to circulate around your identity. Let me tell you, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you know, you can make whatever makes you feel good. Thank you, Jamila. Uh, I have a, a question here from Zoe Miletus. Cool. Uh, she asks, which cities have soundscapes that most interest you and or which soundscapes in nature get you listening most attentively? Okay. Um, birds. <laughs> birds. Any birds anywhere. I love listening to birds. Um, Michelle Pearson Clark uh, shared with me a work. I'm going to just pull it up because Michelle recorded birds in Trinidad, where we are both from. OK, I'm going to find it for you and drop it in the chat. But I love to listen to birds. And Michelle has done this in a sound work that I'm going to share. But um, you know, uh, I try not to uh, create too much preference around, around sound. That's like, that, that might be a mindfulness thing. Because for example, here in New Jersey, there is a culture around cars and engines being super loud, super loud people um, revving. They sound like motorbikes, but my partner is like, no, that's a car. Um, you know, in, in Chicago, there was uh, this super loud um, train system. And it's actually like louder than you're actually, like it's, it's, it's louder than it legally should be for your hearing. Um, and at the time, I really, I hated it fully 100. I, I was like, this is, this is pure torture. And now I hear it. Like if you watch a show that's in, in Chicago, I hear it and I get totally nostalgic. <laughs> um, I also did a ton of recording of sounds in Chicago. Like I would just, you know, record people and places. Um, so, you know, I, I invite you to listen to wherever you are and, and to notice the sounds that you don't like and to notice the sounds that you do like. You know, I think I do prefer like a quiet sound. Um, I like to really kind of stretch to stretch my ears. Um, but I think mostly, mostly birds. Here, I found Michelle Pearson Clark's sound work. I think this is just a, a small project for uh, undecimals, but it, it has the bird sounds that I like the best. Thanks for that question. So I was talking there <laughs> with the, uh, the microphone off. Terrible. That happens all the time. Um, uh, Jamila, I, I see no more questions. Um, uh, I would therefore uh, like to offer my uh, deep and sincere thanks to you uh, 
on behalf of Two Rivers Gallery and uh, of course myself, uh, not only for uh, a, a, a tremendously uh, moving and uh, thought provoking talk, but uh, also for rounding out our uh, AGM with uh, such an inspiring uh, moment. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. You. I, um, I would like to invite uh, all, of, uh, all of you uh, who have been participating this evening to join us next Thursday via Facebook Live uh, for an artist talk with Jessica Thompson, one of the other seven artists participating in this exhibition. And that talk will be starting a little earlier at 6 p.m. Uh, I would again like to thank Jamila uh, and to thank you all for joining us tonight. I would like to wish you all a very good night. And once again, thank you all for your participation. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Lovely to be here. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jamila. Good night.